Thank you for joining us for our presentation today on the new guidelines for introducing peanut to babies and what they mean. My name is Laura Bantock and I'm the director of the Western Region at Food Allergy Canada. I'm delighted to be hosting this session today. The presentation today with Dr. Chan will take approximately 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. So in order to keep the audio as clear as possible, all participants are set on mute. Dr. Chan will be answering questions after the presentation. We've had a large number of questions submitted. Uh, so please type any additional questions into the question box on your control panel and he'll answer as many as he can get to at the end. I'd like to draw your attention to the control panel where you will find the five NIAID resources that you can download during the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties, please go to www.gotowebinar.com for support and troubleshooting. We will be recording this presentation and it will be available on the Food Allergy Canada website in the next couple of days. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to Dr. Edmund Chan, who's a pediatric allergist in Vancouver. He is the head of the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the Department of Pediatrics and Clinical Associate Professor at the University of British Columbia. He sees patients in the allergy clinic at BC Children's Hospital also. Dr. Chan is a clinical investigator at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute and runs a large research program dedicated to the multiple aspects of pediatric food allergy and eosinophilic esophagitis. Dr. Chan is on the board of directors at the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and he's on the executive of the allergy section within the Canadian Pediatric Society. He's also the co-author on the US NIAID Food Allergy Guidelines on Prevention of Peanut Allergy, which was published in January of this year. So without any further delay, I'll hand the presentation over to you, Dr. Chan. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Laura. And welcome, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be doing this. Uh, and it'd be nice if I could see everyone, but I, I uh, am aware that there's people tuning in from across the country. So welcome. Uh, these are my disclosures for the session, the most relevant being that uh, I was on the uh, panel for the uh, NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases Guidelines uh, in the U.S. that was published in January. And so the outline for this talk is to go over food allergy and testing briefly, to look at some previous infant feeding guidelines and then compare them to the new guidelines to reduce peanut allergy to describe some of the supporting research behind the new guidelines uh, that uh, has uh, resulted in uh, these recommendations for parents to give some resources and of course to answer your questions. And so this slide is a pictorial which uh, just introduces the subject of food allergy, trying to convey that food allergy here affecting this uh, little infant affects everyone in that infant sphere. So of course the parents, um, the extended relatives, uh, yeah, when they go to uh, uh, restaurants and, and other settings in the public, uh, when they're on airplanes, uh, the other children they interact with. Uh, it really affects policy uh, uh, at the government uh, level and beyond. Uh, and um, you know, then uh, there is, is the whole healthcare system that's impacted uh, by having an individual with food allergy. When we talk about how food allergy is diagnosed, uh, we start usually you know, with the history. And, and so there's a lot of components to taking a detailed history which uh, supports a diagnosis of food allergy. And then after we have a history which uh, allows us to suspect that, then we go on to testing. And this pictorial is showing uh, skin testing. Uh, there's also specific IgE blood testing. But the most important test is to do an oral food challenge, which I'll come back to throughout the talk. Uh, when we look at how useful the skin or specific IgE blood tests may or may not be, uh, they're actually much less useful than uh, many parents would believe. And so, for example, if you have a positive test, uh, there's a, quite a high chance, uh, especially in the scenario that we're going to talk about today, where the tests are just falsely positive. They're actually not indicative of true allergy. Uh, in contrast, if you have a negative test, generally speaking, 
uh, much more accurate or reliable in saying that there's no food allergy. But this false positive uh, issue uh, is, is really uh, quite germane to the infant who's never eaten something like peanut before. Why should we be focusing on peanut specifically in this discussion? Well, partly it's because that's the food that was studied for the LEAP study, which I'll get into. Uh, but but uh, also, peanut is one of the leading causes of uh, food allergy and uh, more severe reactions. And it's also very difficult to outgrow. Uh, milk and egg allergy has a far better prognosis, for example, in childhood to be outgrown compared to peanut. Uh, this here pictorial is showing the 10 key priority food allergens uh, uh, from Health Canada. And we don't have to venture outside this list um, for the majority of food allergy in children. Uh, one may ask and ponder, why do so many people have food allergies? The various reasons that have been generated have included the hygiene hypothesis, it's too clean in countries like Canada, uh, the skin, meaning that uh, there's a broken skin barrier in, in the majority of infants who go on to develop food allergy. And so that broken skin barrier is, is manifest as eczema or atopic dermatitis. The theory is that the uh, broken skin allows the food to contact the skin and, and be a portal of entry for uh, uh, triggering the immune system. Uh, pollution over the years has been described as a cofactor, but uh, there's not enough research really specifically saying um, how uh, that impacts uh, uh, this food allergy uh, development. And uh, vitamin D hypothesis has also been uh, proposed. Uh, too little vitamin D is the most commonly described scenario that would uh, result in the immune system not developing properly during infancy. But among all these reasons, really the timing of food introduction has been the subject of most attention. Uh, so when to introduce something like peanut to an infant. So in, in the infant feeding guidelines, in the 1990s, food allergy was on the rise. So there was an uh, increase in, in things like peanut allergy. And so the thought at that time in the 1990s and the early 2000s uh, was, why don't you just avoid eating foods which cause allergies and, and sort of like uh, just bury your head in the sand and not have to worry about it. Uh, the thought was as well, based on some animal studies uh, and uh, uh, really theories, uh, was that infants may have an immature gut, a quote-unquote leaky gut, and not be ready for foods like peanut. The problem with this whole rationale was it wasn't based on any clinical trials. So there wasn't a, a trial saying that, oh, you know, you have one group of infants that are given uh, the food early, uh, and they have an immature gut, and therefore they have more peanut allergy. There's nothing like that. And, and so, you know, unfortunately, that then made its way into a, a sort of guideline. It, it was a, a recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics in the year 2000. And it said that uh, infants who are at risk for developing food allergy, and they defined risk as having a first degree relative with an allergic condition, not to be exposed to allergenic foods until they're older. And in the case of peanut and nuts, the recommendation was wait until three years of age. Uh, they even said wait until one for dairy and two uh, for egg. Um, now, in between 2000 until 2008, there's increasing uh, data that peanut allergy was increasing uh, despite the advice to delay peanut uh, and that countries that introduced uh, peanut early, uh, most specifically Israel, uh, had essentially no peanut allergy. And so based on that, in 2008, the American Academy of Pediatrics did a 180 degree. Uh, it wasn't a complete 180 degree. We can say maybe it was a 150 degree. Uh, they said that there was no evidence that delaying beyond four to six months helps uh, prevent uh, uh, peanut allergy or other food allergy. Um, the reason I say it's not a, a 180 degree was uh, there was a slight nuance here. It didn't tell parents that they should introduce peanut containing food at six months. All it said was don't delay, but it didn't say exactly when and, and how to do it. In 2013, we published the very first ever Canadian position statement on this subject, which um, actually was a labor of love that started uh, well before that. Uh, around 2009, 2010, we were already planning that. 
what took so long for that document to come out uh, was um, difficulty in grasping when these infants should be introduced at their earliest time point. Should it be four to six months or should it be six months? And that had to do with the WHO recommendation, which you're all aware of, being uh, to exclusively breastfeed for uh, exactly six months. And so these are, are the type of phrases that were in our 2013 uh, uh, position statement. As you can see, uh, don't delay uh, beyond exactly six months, which is a bit different from the American statement. And uh, you know, when to introduce uh, early is still under investigation. In 2015, immediately after publication of the LEAP study, uh, we uh, gathered together with other countries, so uh, I was representing the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, and we collaborated with ten, uh, with nine other medical organizations uh, around the world to state that uh, we're going to come up with guidelines, but in the meantime, um, you know, finally we can say the word should. So uh, clinicians should be recommending introducing peanut-containing foods for high-risk infants between 4 to 11 months of age. Prior to that, there had never been any sort of communication using the word should. And then, so now we fast forward to 2017, and the NIAID guidelines, um, that was published in January, and it was specifically for preventing peanut allergy. And so, so why uh, was that guideline published? Well, you know, it started with, again, this observation that in Israel, there's essentially no peanut allergy, and in the UK, there's you know a high degree of peanut allergy, uh, the sort of two percent or so that we describe uh, for Canada. And and what uh, in in that type of uh, observational uh, study, what did they find was very different in Israel? Well, they started introducing peanut uh, within the first year of life, you know, starting as early as uh, four months uh, with uh, this uh, snack. Uh, called Bamba, which is made with peanut, and it's a, a puffed corn type of snack. And so, um, you know, it, some of you may or may not be aware, but in Israel, this snack is in every single childcare setting imaginable. I've had parents in my clinic tell me that when they lived in Israel, uh, these uh, uh, Bamba snacks were in preschools, were in schools, in every sort of uh, child activity setting, and even if uh, a child wasn't eating it at home uh, all the time, they were eating it at school all the time, and that would really um, uh, be very conducive towards that regular exposure that's needed once it's introduced. And so, what exactly happens if you feed peanut to babies? How do we answer that question? So that was finally answered by what I've uh, already alluded to, the LEAP study that was published at the beginning of 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's a great study for you to look up and, and read uh, because it's that type of rigorous methodology that's really needed to answer these prevention questions. So what's the rigorous methodology? They recruited 640 high-risk infants defined as severe eczema or egg allergy, and they divided them into different groups. So what they decided to do, and, and this results in some controversy when we try to implement these findings in the real world, but in the uh, 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 within the confines of a study, a research study, they decided to do skin testing uh, to these infants who had never eaten peanut before. And they divided uh, them into two groups, one with small positive allergy tests and another with negative tests. And then they further subdivided them into avoiding or eating. Eating meant eating a large amount frequently. So they had to eat uh, the equivalent of two teaspoons of peanut butter three times a week about six grams of peanut protein uh, per week. And, and so they kept doing that, the group that was eating, until five years of age. And then all of these subgroups had oral food challenges at five years of age to uh, peanut to truly find out what uh, the preventative effect uh, was. Now, I, I need to emphasize that there was a key limitation to the late study, which is they decided to exclude infants with five millimeter and above skin test sizes in the study, they sort of uh, you know assumed that those had peanut allergy. But as we know, uh, you know there's lots of false positives with skin testing. And if you have a five millimeter skin test, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're allergic. So this leap study has not answered that question about 
uh, what to do about the, the slightly larger skin test size. Now, at the five-year time point, what was the uh, outcome? So we had quite an effect. So you had um, for uh, children who had negative skin tests uh, uh, at the beginning of the study, uh, you had an 86% relative risk reduction, and uh, more importantly, an almost 12% absolute risk reduction, uh, meaning that you went from around 14% uh, for those who were avoiding peanut to you know maybe a couple of percent for those who were eating regularly. Uh, in this uh, uh, subgroup, only one had a reaction uh, on uh, the initial uh, introduction in the ingestion group. For the children who had small positive skin tests, uh, there was a, a more dramatic absolute risk reduction. So there's a 25% absolute risk reduction. You had uh, children starting um, with 35% if they were avoiding peanut, and uh, they would uh, you know, be able to prevent down to around 10% or so if uh, eating peanut regularly. So really quite striking. And if we look at levels of evidence in the literature, as you know, the randomized controlled trials are the highest level of evidence when you're looking at a single study. And uh, in contrast, the 2000 AAP recommendations were based on animal studies, opinion papers, and, and so on and so forth. So people ask me, oh, why should we believe the new guidelines when the old guidelines said to avoid? Well, simply because, partly, um, that the old guidelines were based on almost no evidence. They were based on very, very weak evidence. And then the new guidelines are based on strong evidence. So uh, another question here that, that we keep asking is, why would feeding peanut to infants reduce peanut allergy? Um, you know, I already mentioned earlier that the broken skin that, that most of these infants who go on to develop peanut allergy uh, is very conducive towards uh, the immune system in the skin uh, being triggered towards allergy development. Uh, in contrast, if you're eating regularly, early, start, uh, starting early and regularly, uh, the gut now is felt. It was felt to be evil before, but is now felt to be very good. It's, uh, uh, there's immune cells in the gut that uh, uh, result in what we call tolerance. So there's these regulatory T cells, and it, it's a form of educating the immune system when you eat it in the gut uh, to teach the immune system that it's a good uh, uh, exposure and, and it's not something to react to. Now, uh, one question that many parents wonder is once they start, can they ever stop giving the peanuts? Uh, because again, in the study, they were giving it three times a week and it's quite a bit of work. So what the same investigators in the UK did was they did a leap on study where after five years of age, both groups, both the group that had initially avoided and the group that was eating regularly since infancy were asked to avoid peanuts completely for a duration of 12 months. And they did repeat food challenges at six years of age. And the main finding was that there was no increase in peanut allergy at six years of age. Um, so, you know, we, we feel that probably five years enough, but the, to be conservative, uh, the NIAID guideline panel felt that, uh, you know, it is not enough evidence to say that uh, we, we should only eat for five years and, and you know maybe we should say to keep eating it indefinitely but um, you, one would hope that five years is a pretty good duration to be eating. How about other foods? There was the EAT study published in 2016 that was done by the same investigators as the LEAP study. This was a difficult study so they recruited from the general population and what they were trying to do was to compare eating at three months so really pushing the envelope, compare that to starting at six months. And how many foods were they requiring these, these parents give at three months? Uh, they were needed to give milk, egg, peanut, sesame, fish, and wheat in large amounts. And so no wonder it was hard for families to keep feeding all those foods frequently. It's a lot of work uh, to get uh, that into those infants in those amounts. And, and so when they did an intention to treat analysis, they didn't find a difference between introducing at three to six months, but probably that was because so many in the three-month group just weren't able to start those foods. Um, you know, so so that that's the main conclusion out of that study. And so we need to learn more about foods other than peanut, and that's why the NIAID guidelines have been for peanut specifically. Uh, here's a, a bit of uh, fun. Uh, you know, about uh, flip-flopping uh, that uh, constantly seems to be occurring in this field. 
So in 2017, how can we help prevent peanut allergy? And, and so this is when I said earlier that previous guidelines never gave um, the details as to when and how. All it said was don't delay. So, so then it's left, you know, uh, the parents struggling about how they actually do this. Well, finally, these uh, NIAID guidelines help with the when uh, and the how uh, and the duration and th those sort of things. And so what the guidelines have done is to stratify infants into three groups uh, for risk. So it's trying to get away from the older uh, recommendation which was based on family history. This one is basing risk levels on whether you have eczema or egg allergy. So no eczema or egg allergy, mild to moderate eczema or severe eczema and or egg allergy. So if you have one of these uh, first two uh, categories of an infant in your office, they can simply introduce peanut containing food at home. It's only when you get to this group here, the severe eczema and or egg allergy, that there's this in-office evaluation that's suggested by the guidelines to do some sort of peanut testing. Now, how do we define that third group of severe eczema? This is how the guideline defines it. It's persistent eczema assessed by a healthcare provider and key is requiring frequent need uh, for topical uh, steroid or, or calcineurin inhibitors, other anti-inflammatories, uh, and, and so even if those are used, then the eczema persists. And, and so it's not a perfect definition as you can see. You know, some may still be left wondering, you know, I had a, a, a family here in my clinic yesterday where um, they were afraid of topical steroids and topical medications. And so I had difficulty, even though the infant had quite widespread eczema, I had difficulty categorizing that infant as severe eczema and I, I, I was sort of uh, required in this definition to categorize that infant as moderate eczema. Now, another way to think about how many infants have severe eczema is to look at the prevalence of atopic dermatitis in countries like the U.S. And so Eric Simpson is a pediatric dermatologist in Oregon who uh, published uh, an estimate that um, about 67% uh, of eczema in the U.S. is mild, 26% moderate, and 7% severe. And so if you were to do a rough calculation about the general population, you would uh, calculate that only 0.9% of all infants have severe eczema, and about 3.4% have moderate eczema, and 8.7% of all infants that you see have mild eczema. Therefore, about 99% of infants without egg allergy have either no eczema or mild to moderate eczema and can be introduced to peanut at home. Now isn't that shocking because probably in your offices you're not dealing with parents who think that 99% of infants in the, in the general population can start peanut containing food at home. Now the egg allergy definition in the guideline was this, so history of reaction to egg and a positive skin test or a positive oral food challenge to egg. But um, this seems, you know, a little bit out of place in certain ways because uh, uh, there's not that many families that have introduced egg at around six months when we want the, pe yeah, the peanut containing food introduced. Uh, and so we're not likely to see six month olds walking around with egg allergy already. So the majority of infants, again, stressing introduced peanut at home. And, and I, I can't stress that enough in you know, everything that I do for this uh, subject. Now for that, again, that narrow group of severe eczema or egg allergy, we can you know, uh, estimate about one or two percent of infants. Uh, what does the guideline recommend? It recommends either a blood test to peanut or a skin test. If the blood test is done, it would really be in a scenario where there's difficulty accessing skin testing. And so this is something that a primary care physician much more easily orders. Um, but the Canadian Society was really quite concerned that that would be conducive towards panel testing. You know how some families request a whole bunch of foods tested before an infant has ever had the chance to eat. Uh, that's not recommended uh, for foods other than peanut because of poor positive predictive value. Again, getting at how inaccurate these tests are if there's no history. Um, if the test is negative, for the blood test and simply give it home. Uh, it is an option if the practitioner offers it to eat in the office. Uh, if the blood test is positive to any degree, then to see a specialist. 
and you know the specialist would be the one doing the skin test. Now I really want to emphasize this is where we stray from the LEAP study. Here in the guidelines we see that you can have up to seven millimeters. Remember again the LEAP study said five millimeters they're not going to do a challenge. Well in this guideline it says seven millimeters please offer a food challenge, either a supervised feeding in the office or a graded food challenge. It doesn't say in this box, label them with peanut allergy and give an EpiPen. It doesn't get to that type of thinking until eight millimeters. That's a pretty big skin test. So only at eight millimeters do we label the infant as possible peanut allergy and carry an epi epinephrine auto injector. So this is a key, key point and again, this is only applicable for that narrow 1% of infants that we're not going to be giving peanut at home. Now, you may think already that is potentially very difficult to implement. And, you know, for sure, uh, colleagues of mine and myself have felt the same way. Uh, and so a bit conflicted here in, in, in how to apply this uh, guideline in the real world. Paul Turner, Diane Campbell have written recently that the screening skin tests and blood tests are frequently falsely positive, which is what I've said many times already. Um, there's been no reported fatalities from exposure in the first year of life, you know, key being the first year of life. Of course, you know, if you wait till a, a child is much older to try for the first time, uh, you know, we can't guarantee that. Israel has had no screening. Peanut is introduced early and there's essentially no peanut allergy, again, that. Um, and moreover, I frequently worry about this uh, you know, if uh, you do a significant number of skin and blood tests, who is actually going to be doing the oral food challenges? Uh, in my practice area, very, very few uh, allergists and practitioners offer infant oral food challenges. And, you know, one could say that, yeah, you even have, you know, lots of long waiting lists even to get those skin tests. And, of course, there's concerns about screening creep. I spent quite a bit of time describing to you what severe eczema should be. And, and how common it is. But as we all know, in many physician offices and many healthcare scenarios, most parents seem to feel that their infant with mild eczema has severe eczema. And you know, automatically, if you, if you over-label infants with severe eczema, you're going to, in this uh, guideline, be resulting in over-testing with blood and skin tests. Um, you know, this is further magnified when I throw in data like this. We've been doing a study through the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology uh, asking our allergist members uh, whether they even offer food challenges to infants. And, and it's, you know, quite striking that some allergists that respond to the survey never ever do food challenges in infants. Some rarely do them. And then even of, of concern is how long they have infants wait between a positive skin test and the date of the food challenge, and then some have them wait several months. And in those months, uh, you could be really counteracting any uh, preventative benefit of introducing early, because by the time those months have elapsed, the infant could be over one year of age. So, okay, home introduction for most infants. Uh, how do you do that home introduction? Well, the NIAID guidelines in the appendices provide information for that, very detailed feeding instructions. And, you know, some of the highlights are that the infant should be uh, well on the day they've started, should be developmentally ready for solids, uh, give it home, not in a restaurant or a daycare for the first time, uh, always be aware of peanut uh, as a choking hazard and the form of peanut uh, being very important, and of course stop if there's a, a reaction, uh, and dedicate a few hours the first time you do it. Um, you know, to assess. Uh, an example of a non-choking form of peanut would be, this is right lifted from the guidelines, uh, mixing uh, peanut butter with hot water so that it's less of a glob and less likely to be a choking hazard. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we did this yesterday, for example, with one of our infants, uh, just give a small amount uh, the first time uh, and then give a larger amount, maybe 10 or 15 minutes uh, later. This is described in the guidelines. Uh, if it's a, a more a food challenge scenario, we'll be dividing the doses into more different doses, for example, five doses, which is also described in the guidelines. Um, so again, this is what I just described for the very low risk type of situation. Uh, very few of the infants uh, are expected to have a reaction, severe reaction being very unlikely. So, you know, this is important to emphasize to parents. 
they're always thinking that it's 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 so high chance that there's going to be a, a severe reaction, but the data that we have in literature suggests no, it's very, very unlikely the first time uh, you eat it. Of course, if any reaction occurs that's severe, then just like any severe reaction uh, an infant has to anything, uh, call 911. And so I wanted to just quickly show a couple of cases here that I, I've had uh, in my office. I've accumulated so many cases now of early peanut introduction. I have at least uh, yeah, 30 cases or so which are really permutations showing the difficulties with implementation. And so this case here was um, a scenario where there's an older sibling with peanut allergy, very convincing peanut allergy. And, and as with many of these cases, both parents are very knowledgeable actually. They're both dermatologists and they're aware of the skin barrier defect issue and they're aware of a no benefit to delay. And so they decided with that older child to introduce peanut at six months because they had read all the guidelines and they were fully aware, but it didn't work. So even at that early age of six months, the child had already developed peanut allergy. So now mother is currently pregnant with a second child and she's asking me, given that the older sister reacted at the young age of six months, when should they be introducing for the second child? And so we're really shackled again because the Canadian society Pediatric Society says, uh, because of WHO exclusive breastfeeding for six months, we cannot introduce peanut before six months. So the big question that we should ponder is, the CPS was resistant in 2013, but are they more receptive now to maybe changing the messaging a little bit, uh, something a bit softer, like introduce solids at around six months, but not before it's four months, okay? So this is still a, a discussion that we're having with the Pediatric Society and others who are really strongly adhering to the exclusive breastfeeding for six months. It's a work in progress still. Now another case is really trying to highlight the difficulties with, with testing and, and how that really impacts infant care. So there's a child that I saw who lives in Calgary. And this infant had a history of dry skin, no clear eczema. So this is like a home introduction, low risk situation. Uh, the mom was completely unaware of early introduction until she saw me on TV in January when the guidelines were published. And, and then after seeing that, she decided, okay, I'm going to introduce peanut containing food at home. Four days of doing that, no problems. On the fifth day, there was some redness on the face. Um, saw the family doctor, ordered the blood test, it was positive at 2 KU per liter. Then this is where it gets a bit confusing what happened. I don't know why the infant was referred to an internist, so an adult uh, medicine specialist. But referred to that specialist, a skin test was done, and these were the results, everything positive. And, and I, I still don't know why almond, cashew, sesame, macadamia, egg white were done, but everything was positive. I still don't know what four means. Was it four millimeters? Was it four plus? But was referred to me as a second opinion. They flew from Calgary to Vancouver, and I saw the infant at eight months of age. I triaged to be seen sooner. I was very concerned at what had happened to this family. I repeated all skin tests as, you know, something just to, to sort of like, just to humor me. Like, you know, what's the deal with these skin test results? You know, they were all negative. Every single skin test that I repeated was negative, and I was quite disappointed that this family had experienced that. Then immediately on the same day, I did a peanut butter challenge, completely passed. Now, what I did do before I did the challenge was I put a thick layer of Vaseline around the mouth, and so my diagnosis uh, was contact irritation around the mouth. When I asked the mother for more detailed history, what she described was at the fifth day when there was redness, it was really just uh, narrow to around the mouth. And so big questions that emanate from a case like this are why are the, the tests so inaccurate so often and they're so difficult to interpret for so many physicians and moreover, why do so few physicians offer oral food challenges, especially to infants? And so those all cases all illustrate these implementation dilemmas that we have. So we have guidelines now, but, but there's still going to be a lot of work needed for implementation. And so these are the references for some of the guidelines and other uh, source of in information such as Food Allergy Canada, CSACI, there, there's a LEAP study and, and eczema uh, resource there and another sort of uh, uh, fun type of uh, slide here 
um, you know, when I was your age, there were no food allergies, and um, now there are food allergies uh, uh, someday. Uh, so I wanted to really bring uh, it to two key take-home messages that are really going to be pivotal for implementation going forward. Uh, first is that be aware that the vast majority of infants can have peanut-containing food at home. They don't need to have testing and, and see a physician and do it in the office. 98 to 99 percent can have it in, introduced at home. And that's where you, as uh, healthcare professionals, your role comes in in terms of reassuring these families. Um, the other key take-home message is that even if you, know, you have in your practice parents that are fearful of introducing at home, it's important to convey to the parents that you know they can seek a physician to help them with the introduction, but if that results in reliance on skin or blood tests, uh, really be aware that they're extremely unreliable and it's really um, undesirable to have a diagnosis of peanut allergy, to walk around saying that my child is allergic to peanut simply based on a skin test or a blood test. Really, we have to seek the oral food challenge but that's the, 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 the procedure that's so, so limited in countries like Canada right now. Uh, and, and so be very skeptical of a positive skin or blood test when the infant has never, ever eaten peanut before or has eaten, and it's just so unconvincing, the history. So, um, yeah, thank you to Food Allergy Canada and the CSACI for, for sponsoring this. Uh, Laura, I'm going to hand it over to Laura. Uh, now to uh, say a few words. Oh, thanks very much for a great presentation. So we've um, got a lot of questions to get through, Dr. Chan. So number one is, uh, do you feel that the duration of breastfeeding will be impacted and what effect this potentially would have on infant nutrition? We've had a few questions actually about breastfeeding. So if you could yeah. sort of talk about that, that would be great. Yeah, well, and that's exactly why I wanted to focus so much on that issue with the case. Now, it, it comes down to a few things. Uh, one is that some people think that if you introduce at four months, it's a lot better than introducing at six months in terms of preventing peanut allergy. So I want to weaken that thought a little bit. So there's actually very little data in the literature comparing four months versus six months. We actually, uh, some of my colleagues and I, did a secondary analysis of the LEAP study and we found that, well, you know, every age point in the LEAP study, there was over 90% uh, preventative effect if you introduced early. And, in, in, you know, in doing this analysis, maybe introducing at six months was slightly even better than four months. So it sort of, you know, poured a bit of cold water on this thought that four months is a lot better than six months. Again, the EAT study, it was really hard for parents to comply with so many different foods at three months. And so they found no difference. Uh, you know, mainly because it was difficult to adhere to in three versus six months. So I've, I've sort of weakened this sort of thought that four months is better than six months. But I also want to weaken the thought that exclusive breastfeeding for six months is hugely, you know, better than exclusive breastfeeding for four months. So what's the main benefit of breastfeeding for six months? Over and over there's this probit trial quoted, uh, a study from Belarus, and what it showed was 13% versus 9% GI infection. And what's highly interesting is that that red group um, that had more uh, uh, GI infections compared to the blue group, the blue group, only 8% were exclusively breastfed at six months, even though they were getting intense breastfeeding education. And so this 13 versus 9% really frames the bulk of why uh, the WHO says that you should exclusively breastfeed, breastfeed for six months. Now, some then say that, oh, if I uh, breastfeed for exclusively for less than six months, then I'm going to be less inclined to, to breastfeed uh, for six months or longer. Well, the studies don't show that at all. The Swedish study in 2001 showed that that wasn't true. And again, the EAT study showed that that wasn't true. There was a lot of breastfeeding in both groups still, even though they were introducing uh, uh, solids a bit earlier. So what I've, I've done with this, and we published this, uh, this is the reference here, is I've weakened the arguments for both introducing at four months being a lot better for preventing peanut allergy and exclusively breastfeeding being a lot better uh, for, for uh, GI infection or duration of breastfeeding, which is why, again, 
uh, we're trying to uh, convey that maybe a compromise is needed here. Okay, great answer. So um, just switching a topic to eczema, given the relationship between eczema and food allergy, do you have any comments about a more aggressively treating eczema before induction, introduction of peanut? Uh, parents are often nervous about treating with steroids, but this might change their mind. Yeah. Now on that note, there's even a step back that we should take. So a couple of years ago, there were a couple studies published which were really, really fascinating. So they took infants who had a family history of uh, eczema or allergy, and they said that before the infant even develops eczema, so that as soon as the infant is born, start moisturizing like crazy. Moisturize with thick cream moisturizer every single day. And simply by doing that, at six months of age when the study reassessed the infants, they found more than 50% reduced risk of developing eczema simply by moisturizing. Okay, so that's important to describe to, to families who have a family history of some uh, allergic condition or eczema. And I talk about it all the time in my clinic. Now, specific to your question, so what if the infant, despite doing that, has developed eczema at a couple months of life? Uh, should you aggressively treat with topical medication and so on and so forth? Well, yes. Um, you know, a couple of uh, reasons. One is that if you treat with topical steroid or anti-inflammatory, then you make that skin bare intact and you don't have that constantly exposed skin uh, in that window of opportunity of four to 11 months where your immune system is trying to do this push versus pull of developing allergy versus uh, not. And, and so that really helps to maintain the barrier. The other thing is that it's very, very difficult to assess an infant who has uncontrolled eczema when they start a food like peanut. I had that scenario exactly yesterday in my clinic. I had a family come in where they were so afraid of topical steroid that this infant was uh, covered with eczema and yet they wanted to introduce peanut early. So we introduced peanut yesterday in clinic, but the child was scratching before the challenge. This child was scratching during and after, and I really couldn't tell uh, what was being induced or not by the peanut. And so it made for a fairly inconclusive challenge. So, so for those reasons, really, really uh, aggressively treat the atopic dermatitis. There's a way to use topical steroids safely that's beyond the, the subject of today's uh, talk. That could be a whole talk in itself, but there is a way to use topical steroids safely. Okay, great question. Um, next one is, uh, do you suggest allergy testing prior to introduction of peanuts if the child has cow's milk allergy? So, no. And, and that's because, as you can see in the guidelines, uh, the only categories which necessitated testing uh, were severe eczema or egg allergy. In, in the research setting, there's been some uh, cohort studies where they've looked long term. So if you start with a child who has cow's milk allergy, does that increase the risk of peanut allergy subsequently? that so far hasn't been a strong signal. Um, the other confusing element is, is unlike other foods, cow's milk allergy is a fairly nebulous term in an infant. If you say egg allergy or peanut allergy, you're pretty confident in your mind that that means like, oh, the infant gets hives uh, quite immediately or difficulty breathing or something like that. When you say cow's milk allergy for an infant, it could have all these different forms. It could have blood in the stools. It could have vomiting both non-IgE mediated scenarios, and it could also have the hives uh, soon after ingestion. And, and so the, the non-IgE mediated ones especially uh, wouldn't be the type of ones which would increase risk of peanut allergy. Okay, uh, this one's about testing. Is there a standard age for infants to be eligible for skin prick testing and or blood testing? Many physicians do not refer clients for testing of any kind before 12 months of age. Any comments on this? Yeah, so I get asked this very frequently, and there is this misconception in, in the uh, uh, primary care uh, physicians and, and with, with parents that you have to wait until 12 months to do any sort of uh, allergy testing in infants. So you have to wait till then to do a skin test and, and then maybe do a blood test before. Uh, but that's not true. You can do a skin test really at any age. What I prefer to steer the discussion towards is that in that first year of life, 
there should be very, very few scenarios for requiring uh, food testing, and, and when there are, there should be a very limited number of tests. So for the infant who's never eaten an allergenic food before, who has severe eczema or egg allergy, we're saying that, okay, maybe you just do peanut test uh, for that. But you don't do that for all the other uh, foods that are allergenic that an infant hasn't tried. And you also, if a child has tried something and reacted, the, the breadth, the number of foods that you're contemplating testing on is not that uh, long either. Um, you know, when I showed the 10 priority allergens, really that covers the majority of infant and child food allergy. And, um, you know, we won't, won't, shouldn't be venturing outside of that, even for foods that have been tried and have caused hives or some type of a, a reaction. So, you know, the key is to minimize a uh, number of tests because uh, of the false positives. Okay. So uh, in a case where there's older siblings uh, who has a diagnosis of peanut allergy, should these infants be assessed prior to introduction of peanut? And do you have any strategies to suggest uh, for families who want to do this? Yeah, that's uh, quite um, a concern for many families uh, who uh, have an older sibling or, or even the parent themselves have peanut allergy. But as you can see, the guidelines chose not to go there. And, and so why did the guidelines not include that as a risk category? It's because the, the literature has described about a 7% uh, risk uh, of peanut allergy uh, in uh, the younger siblings of those who have peanut allergy, 7 or 10% type of risk. Um, that risk is not uh, being explained in any degree of detail, and, and so it's not appearing that it's a specific peanut gene that is that is uh, inherited by that younger sibling. How some of us, many of us, are choosing to interpret that now is that those younger siblings in those studies were never introduced to peanut containing food at around six months. They were delayed until two or three years of age. So of course you're going to expect those younger siblings to have more peanut allergy. Um, it's not like they're walking around and, and, and they're at this high degree of risk, much higher than any other child. It, it, it's probably simply that those families, um, you know, sort of naturally decide to delay. And so what this results in is a discussion of does the family, A, feel comfortable giving younger sibling peanut and having older sibling avoid? And that's another discussion, but it's basically, uh, oh, you know, is it a peanut-free home? If it's not, then they do it very carefully. If it is, uh, then maybe they uh, go out uh, to a friend's place or wherever to give the younger sibling uh, peanut on a regular basis. Um, and uh, it, it really, you know, isn't the type of scenario where we want to do testing because the testing in the scenarios is quite frequently falsely positive. Okay. Um... In a client who has peanut allergy, do you have suggestions for safely introducing peanut to their infant? You touched on that just briefly, but I um, wonder if you can make a quick comment about, so a mum who has uh, peanut allergy herself. Yeah, so that, uh, you know, is a concern for some of these families as well. And um, many of the parents affected by peanut allergy just don't feel comfortable. And, and so you know, hopefully it won't be both parents having peanut allergy. Typically when I've had this scenario in clinic, it's been one of the parents, and I just had it last week, where the mother is allergic to peanut. And so both parents came to the visit, and they were not comfortable introducing peanut at home. So I did the uh, oral challenge. And what happened was the mother was still in the room, but the dad was the one who was actually physically giving the peanut butter to the infant. And, and so it's, it's a, a bit of education about how that mother should feel, you know, that it's safe for her to be in the same room. Like, like she can, you know, some parents have this myth that, oh, you know, just being around in the room where there's peanut butter, they're going to somehow inhale something and have an anaphylactic reaction. Well, no, it's, it's dispelling that myth. And she can be in the room and she can help support uh, the rest of the family uh, during that and observe. Um, uh, but... Uh, you, you can, she can allow some other uh, family member, uh, such as the other parent, uh, uh, to administer. Um, there was uh, a concern raised uh, uh, by some in this scenario of uh, what if that infant then eats and then the infant is being breastfed still 
and, and so that mother with the peanut allergy uh, then breastfeeds. Well, yes, that would be a, a more risky situation because as we all know, nipples can get cracked and they can bleed and if the infant has just had some peanut butter and then latches on, yes, of course, that could result in uh, uh, passing the uh, peanut allergen through the bloodstream of the mother and result in her having a, a reaction. So, yeah, that uh, would uh, not be a, a good uh, uh, source of uh, uh, exposure there and that there would have to be some discussion about what to do about that. Okay. Um, some parents and children are anxious about food allergy. Do you have recommendations um, and or resources or sources for treatment for those uh, people struggling with anxiety? Yeah, so it's a very common scenario these days. Um, you know, it's not as well described in the literature, quantified in the literature as we would like, but certainly in my clinic, I'm seeing it all the time, and uh, even in our research program, we're designing uh, all sorts of studies to get a better handle on that, as well as uh, to come up with better solutions to diagnose it in clinic and, and to give further management options. So at, at present, uh, there are some articles that parents will come across. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I recall an Allergic Living article, uh, that magazine, um, had touched upon this and, and given some general advice such as cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, in British Columbia, there's this uh, Anxiety BC uh, uh, organization which uh, helps with anxiety in general. Um, there are certain uh, psychologists who have uh, more expertise in this, but uh, there's actually very few psychologists overall who have the experience with uh, food allergy. So. You know, it would, it would of course start with a discussion uh, with the uh, uh, healthcare professionals that the family sees. Uh, it would start with a discussion with one of you in the audience, uh, uh, possibly, a discussion with the primary care uh, physician, and that discussion would involve education. So a lot of the things that, that I was conveying during the presentation could be used as reassurance. Very low chance of reaction the first time. Only, you know, 1% that need that sort of in-office sort of thing. These are factoids that many parents are not aware of because everywhere they turn, internet and relatives and others, they're given uh, the misinformation. And, and so if, despite getting all that information, uh, they're still highly anxious, it's, it's trying to get them into that office which will offer the in-office experience, the in-office uh, ingestion of, of the food. Here in BC, uh, Laura and I are, are both involved in having um, a, a, a different discussion with public health nurses, uh, maybe we can get some of these very, very afraid uh, parents to uh, have a discussion with the public health nurses uh, in their offices and then maybe there you know, could be a periodic session uh, where uh, in that uh, 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 health unit uh, the parent could bring uh, the peanut containing food and even feed the infant there. Uh, and, and take it to a, a more public health uh, level because we're, at the end of the day this is a prevention issue. Right. So this is a question that just came in and it's sort of a, a follow-on and it says, so is it fair to say from the guidelines that primary care physicians should feel comfortable doing an oral challenge in their office if patients are not comfortable doing it at home? Now presumably oral challenge means introduction of peanut, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that would be um, possible for the uh, risk uh, groups that uh, describe about 99% of infants. So, for the no eczema or uh, egg allergy or the mild to, to moderate eczema, uh, by all means. Um, and, you know, it could also be uh, the scenario where a primary care physician has an infant with severe eczema or egg allergy and uh, goes on to do a blood test and then uh, with that blood test result it's, it's negative uh, and so introduce peanut at home. Uh, I, I wouldn't suggest that for the scenario where the blood test is positive because as you can see uh, then um, it, it moves on to seeing a specialist at that point. But of course the blood test would only be offered for this uh, severe eczema group and um, the majority of infants 
uh, would be in the uh, mild to moderate or the no eczema groups. So yeah, as long as the primary care physician is, is comfortable, it's just providing an environment where the parent feels more comfortable knowing that they have supports in doing that. But the chance of a child having anaphylaxis in these two groups is extremely, extremely remote. And that should be reassuring for the primary care physician. And, and many primary care physicians do things like give vaccines. And you know, infants can get anaphylaxis from vaccines. There's, there's more things than introducing peanut that could result in anaphylaxis. So you know, primary care physicians should be prepared to manage anaphylaxis uh, in a variety of settings. You know, many of them even administer uh, subcutaneous immunotherapy. You know, patient with uh, uh, bad allergic rhinitis getting shots with pollen and things like that, that could result in anaphylaxis. Right, right. I've had a couple of questions around this topic, um, namely, should parents be trying peanut butter on the hand or the cheek of their infant to see if there's any allergic reaction prior to giving peanut orally? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, you know, as I described in that case, putting peanut containing food on the skin can be potentially irritating. So that's exactly what this parent, you know, not knowing she was doing that, did. She, she took this peanut butter and then uh, infants are messy when they're eating and then it resulted in it contacting the skin around the mouth and then that was misinterpreted as peanut allergy. And, and so the exact same thing can happen when you rub some peanut butter on the arm or wherever it is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really the uh, specific Ig blood test and, and the uh, epicutaneous skin test, which are uh, the proper tests, uh, but again, only for that severe eczema egg allergy group. Right. So how will the guidelines be widely disseminated in a consistent manner to all the healthcare professionals in Canada who need uh, to be updated? Yeah, so um, in Canada, there, there's been a few things. Uh, the Canadian Society of Allergy and Immunology published an editorial and also co-published the actual guidelines. So the guidelines aren't just being published in an American journal. They're being published in journals around the world, and the Canadian Allergy Journal is one of them. And hopefully that will result in it reaching more Canadian uh, practitioners. But uh, we found that different uh, healthcare professional groups require different approaches. And, and so, um, you know, I'm involved with colleagues in, in disseminating at all those levels. And, and so for the pediatricians, uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society, um, we're uh, doing various uh, uh, practice points and, and position statements. Our 2013 position statement will need to be updated. Uh, we've been giving lectures to the pediatricians. For the family physicians, we're hoping to involve them in the next Canadian Pediatric Society uh, position statement. Um, for uh, public health nurses, uh, there you know, are these type of webinars. Uh, the Food Allergy Canada has been very helpful in, in linking us to uh, that group. And then I'm also in BC having these discussions uh, provincially, and Laura has been very helpful with that for uh, engaging the public health nurses through various educational and uh, in health, health unit initiatives. Uh, Laura and I actually hope to expand those initiatives across the country if we're able to prove that they're effective in British Columbia. Uh, for the dietitians, I actually work very closely with a couple of dietitians. One is Linda Kirsty at HealthLink BC, and another is Becky Blair at Dietitians of Canada. And um, both provincially and nationally, uh, we've been uh, producing uh, documents for uh, dietitian audiences. And so it'll continue to require a multi-pronged approach. Different uh, healthcare professionals re require different approaches uh, for reaching them. And, and of course, the parents, you know, uh, you know there, there was a lot of media coverage, uh, which was exhausting. Uh, in January, but also very necessary, and um, it'll continue to require engaging parents in, in, in unique ways. Okay, so I want to squeeze in this last question, um, but we, I see that we've got about a minute left, so if you have a quick comment about this. This question is about uh, severe peanut allergy that is airborne, and I just wondered if you wanted to just very quickly address um, the idea of airborne peanut allergy. Yeah, so th there's actually been studies where uh, they put peanut butter in one part of the room and um, they have patients with peanut allergy uh, in the room and, and nothing happens. And, and so, you know, that smell of peanut butter is simply the oil 
uh, and, and that is not allergenic because the allergen is in protein. In contrast, now we have these products like PB2 peanut butter powder or, or peanut flour. Those products, if there's especially some sort of fan in the room or some sort of uh, wind current, if those powdered products contact the eyes or then fly into the nose and inhale through the mouth and, and contact you know, uh, open skin, yes, of course that could be uh, transmission there and result in reaction. But that scenario is typically not what most parents are asking me about. They're typically asking about, oh, little Johnny sitting next to my child eating a peanut butter sandwich. Right, right. Well, that really brings us to the close, uh, Dr. Jan. I, I want to thank you very much for a really fascinating presentation. It's obviously a very hot topic. We've been inundated with questions. I'm sorry to those that we, we didn't get to. I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the development team from the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, namely Dr. Kyla Hildebrand, Dr. Julia Upton, Dr. Alyssa Abrams, and Dr. David Fisher, and of course you, Dr. Chan, and the rest of my Food Allergy Canada colleagues who've all helped to bring you this presentation today. I'd just like to mention that there will be a short survey that you'll receive through GoToWebinar in the next hour or so, so if you could, please just take a moment to complete that. So this now brings us to the end of our time with you today. We hope that you found this information valuable. If you have further questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're here to answer those questions. And thanks again, everyone, for attending and submitting some really great questions. So take care and have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.